That was terrific. And the, uh, Mr. Todd's assessment of the intellectual capabilities of the architectural profession, uh, I guess, relieves me of the responsibility of <laughs> adhering to the facts in this case. I <laughs> present to you um, what our rocket center <coughs> means to me, um, given this the distinguished panel um, and my usual role of presenting one slide after another, I thought I would read you the scholarly papers. So this I, I do it a great deal. Uh, several years ago, I was asked to write an essay on the architect who had most profoundly affected my work. As a student, Lewis Kahn dominated my thoughts. After graduate school, I was privileged to work closely with I.M. Pei on the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. The work of Albert Alto and Jaron Utsen has resonated with me for reasons greater than my Nordic heritage. However, it is my belief that buildings, not the individuals behind them, should be an architect's fundamental source of inspiration. Consequently, I selected not just a building, but rather a group of buildings as my seminal influence. My career has been devoted, in part, to finding strategies for the urban high-rise office building. No building or group of buildings has been more influential to me in that search than Rockefeller Center. Conceived and designed during a period of great prosperity and executed during a period of economic despair, Rockefeller Center reveals both in its architecture and its process of design numerous paradoxes whose resolution brought about the greatest urban architectural assemblage of the 20th century. The Rockefeller Center that we revere today is a result of what must have been a titanic effort. An effort that, for me, is symbolized by the statue of Atlas facing visitors as they enter off Fifth Avenue. The reality and the myth of Rockefeller Center have had a profound impact on my architectural sensibility. I identify it, architecture, not an architect, buildings and not a building, as my most significant architectural influence. My architecture, architectural practice brings me into frequent confrontation with this question. Does designing large-scale urban buildings for those who use them as financial instruments of profit diminish artistic resolve and promote an inevitable compromise of ideals? Rockefeller Center has proved itself a beacon showing that there is a way out of this contemporary labyrinth. The status of Rockefeller Center as a masterpiece is undeniable. Its architecture, evaluated solely through artistic merit, compared me to study it closely. So engaged, one quickly understands that the process of design was as unusual and exceptional as the architecture it created. All those involved in this process were in pursuit of excellence. Each defined excellence in somewhat different terms. Each respected, I thought, the other's definition. Above all, they realized the juxtaposition of Rockefeller Center as a financial enterprise and Rockefeller Center as a work of art to be the guiding dynamic of the research. The architectural critic and historian Colin Rowe said that, the tradi that traditional architecture is largely focused on the internal angle which creates forms embracing space. In contrast, modern architecture, he said, is the product of the external angle that creates form as an isolated object. One only has to look at the contemporary city to understand the condition Mr. Rowe so neatly summarized. Rockefeller Center, however, bonds the reading of buildings as figural objects and space as figural void into a fluctuating state of coexistence, thereby reconciling the conflict between the traditional and the modern condition. Most remarkable, the example set by Rockefeller Center was subsequently ignored. Soon after its construction, modern architecture took center stage. And its influence brought about the contemporary city a city of unrelated structures, standing alone with little regard for each other and with even less regard for effectively shaping space into a larger public realm. 
the propensity for the modern city for isolated architectural events is further exacerbated by the fact that most contemporary urban structures are high-rise buildings. Once during a more romantic period in our history, these buildings were called skyscrapers, a term that engendered visions of poetic, the poetic possibilities inherent in their type. Now few take claim to such ambitions. At best, we can only refer to them as tall buildings. What is our modern city, if not predominantly an assemblage of large-scale structures of commercial sponsorship? The character of our major cities is defined by their ubiquitous distribution. These buildings, as instruments of profit, exploit the economic possibilities of excessive density. Rarely, however, do they give back to a place anything anything uh, that they take. Why then, given the effect that they have in our physical realm, are the urbanistic issues tall buildings raise given so little attention? To me, concern for the role of the tall building within the city is fundamental to the concern for urbanism as an architectural issue. One does not exist without the other. At the beginning of the last century, the picture was remarkably different. Although Cass Gilbert underscored the exploitive qualities of tall buildings when he said, the skyscraper is an invention that makes the land pay. He went on to design the great Woolworth building, one of the most romantic skyscrapers of the era. Then architects enthusiastically accepted the challenge of high-rise buildings. New York in the 1920s was an era that brought together theatricality and power. New Yorkers are proud of the city's financial strength and encourage the cultural and artistic opportunities that both afforded and attracted. Architects trained in the system of the Beaux-Arts and intoxicated by the spirit of Art Deco rose to the challenge. They conceived many of our most exuberant tall buildings to represent the success of the corporations or institutions that sponsored them. It was a remarkably coherent and focused outpouring of architectural creativity aimed at defining the character and spirit of New York during a great period of civic optimism. During those heady days, theoretical visions for the development of New York also occupied the minds of its architects. Hugh Ferris, the great architectural illustrator, and architect Raymond Hood and Henry Corbett took as a point of departure the hard-headed reality of New York's existing urban condition. Ferris translated the demanding setback profile of the 1916 New York Zoning Code into a poetic vision of tall buildings almost geological in their power and form. Hood, too, explored the metaphor of the skyscraper as urban mountain in his Manhattan 1950 plan. In it, a confluence of skyscrapers celebrated the critical junctures in Manhattan's neutral grid. Corbett envisioned New York on a Venetian model, vertically separating vehicular and pedestrian movement. Theirs was a type of urbanistic alchemy. For Hood and Corbett, theory turned into practice when they were invited to join the design team for Rockefeller Center. However, for me, the spirit and power of Ferris's drawings was perhaps the most influential as a visual stimulus for the design of Rockefeller Center. Now, 75 years after it was built, Rockefeller Center remains the dominant illustration of the urban possibilities inherent in high-rise buildings. Ideas fundamental to this brilliant work breathe with as much vitality today as when they were initially conceived. The team that created Rockefeller Center included a divergent cast of characters. At one pole was a client, John D. Rockefeller Jr., who wanted to leave New York a great architectural legacy one that would also illustrate the principles of his own personal philosophy. At the other pole stood Raymond Hood, a man fully aware of the normity of the architectural responsibility and romantically inspired by the poetic possibilities of the city of towers. Between were positioned the balancing sensibilities of contractors, real estate developers, and a number of independent architects. The design process they collect collectively created while necessarily collaborative and inevitably competitive, was primarily comparative. Every possibility, every concept was drawn, modeled, critiqued, and analyzed by the entire ensemble. 
Early individual contributions by both Hood and Corbett were discarded as were hundreds more until gradually a final shape and form emerged from the pressures of program and context. Theirs was not a process that tolerated artistic grandstanding. It was one that allowed only the best concepts to be realized regardless of their source. The only hierarchy they realized was one of ideas. The humility of their collective dynamic is illustrated most nobly by one of John D. Rockefeller's credos cast in the tablet in Rockefeller Center. Quote, I believe that only in the purifying fire of sacrifice is the dross of selfishness consumed and the greatness of the human soul set free. Unquote. All this having been said, Rockefeller Center did not come about without a powerful source of artistic inspiration. My eyes identified one source of this inspiration, the metaphor of a skyscraper as an urban mountain. Seen across Central Park on a misty night, a little distance separates its built form from the evocations of a visionary Ferris rendering. With the, God, the guiding spirit of this dominant metaphor, designers of Rockefeller Center were able to breathe energy into its potentially ponderous volumes. Mountains smoothly connect through a series of escalating heights, the horizontal condition to the vertical. Similarly, Rockefeller Center follows nature's compositional example and fulfills the skyscraper's responsibility of meaningfully joining earth and sky. The vertical boundaries of Rockefeller Center are so energetically composed that they vigorously compel the eye to move from height to greater height. The French and English buildings can almost be thought of as the foothills initiating this climb to the center's peak, the often clouded, trotted rainbow room. The rock-cut quality of the center's volumes vividly fulfills the geological connection. Slab-like strata peel away as the buildings ascend, revealing rooftop gardens on their horizontal ledges. These gardens are an urban inversion of Machu Picchu perched high in the Andes. Machu Picchu is a work of man and a work of nature. Rockefeller Center's gardens are nature surrounded by man-made mountains. While the vertical boundaries of Rockefeller Center engage the sky, the lateral boundaries create a bond with the surrounding context. Rather than stridently marking the entrance to a precinct, the boundaries of the, Rockefeller, of the center engage their neighbors in an embracing dialogue. If the protagonist in Rockefeller Center's vertical procession is a figural solid of its tallest structure of the RCA building, the stabilizing component of its lateral dynamic is the carefully scaled void of the center's skating rink. Accidentally connected between Fifth Avenue and the RCA Tower, the extraordinary intimacy of the spatial sequence of this, to the center's center is created by the skillful manipulation of volume that never allows mass to overwhelm space. Most brilliantly, one is drawn by gravity toward this focus. Here, Rockefeller Center creates equilibrium between buildings and space, a space that achieved before or since in the modern city. <laughs> Rockefeller Center was designed at a time when functionalist theories emanating from the Bauhaus encouraged buildings of a similar type to speak a similar language, regardless of place. Few structures are as susceptible to the imposition of an intended international vocabulary as is a tall office building. Its form and function often offer little resistance to reductive abstraction or, for that matter, to any form of styling. However, the international style had little influence on the designers of Rockefeller Center. Their intention was to absorb inspiration from the style and character of Manhattan, balancing the heroic visions of Hugh Harris's urban geology with the mature evolution of Art Deco as an architectural style. They deftly wove machine edges into weighty surfaces vertically striated in cleft limestone. The resulting dynamic between nature and the machine reinforces the dialectical strength of the architecture, creating a perfect balance of 1920s verb and 1930s sobriety. Together, they seem to represent reality and optimism engaged in the pursuit of an ideal. No arch work of architecture has more successfully forged a connection to place and to time. Is Rockefeller Center a masterpiece without a genius? Unless one had direct exposure to the process of its design, it is impossible to judge. Certainly the previous work of the team's most prominent architect, Raymond Hood, was skillful and inspiring. However, 
none of it rises to the aesthetic level of Rockefeller Center. Together, the team accomplished something none had achieved alone. The process was almost that of the scientific method. Theirs was a process at once collaborative, comparative, and competitive. The making of large-scale urban architecture with its complex requirements demands such a method. However, as with any form of human activity, it requires the right participants. It has always been my aspiration to participate with highly talented and motivated architects in a design process that enables the best architectural ideas to be realized. No better model exists than this work for this working method than Rockefeller Center. Thank you.